looking into some additional software here to see if I can potentially change the resolution on EV Nova. So, I don't know. Let's, let's see if I can fix a thing, because... I've been having some trouble reading this, and I love this game. I want to I wanna go through the story with you folks. I just want to also make certain I'm not straining my eyes while trying to do it. Okay. Copy. Paste. Continue. That's interesting. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Replace, yes. Extract to here. Okay, run this. Even about not found, make certain you put me in the correct directory. Okay, I see. Okay, that didn't work. Mm. Even though it not found, make certain you put me in the correct directory. Well, I guess that isn't going to run, so... It might be because it's currently running in the background. Let's try that one more time. Yep, it was because it's running in the background. Okay. Uh... Okay. Okay, I believe I may... Oh, update rule. Why does that change to an extra weird resolution? Let's see here, set preferences. Run the window, don't run a window. Quit. Launch again. Must run in 256 or thousands of colors. Oh. <clears throat> I may have broken this. Zero, two, four, seven, six, eight, eight hundred, six hundred, zero. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Update. Well, now it's got a weird offset. Why is it doing that? Set preferences. Run in a window. Okay, quit Nova. Start again. We will get this. Now it's doing that weird window again. 
part of the problem I've been running across is it's like clipping the bottom of the whole screen off, and I can't see the text when it tells me like you can't dock here, or uh, this ship is hostile, or you can't board it, or whatever. Like that just hasn't been showing up, so. That's been a bit of a challenge. Um, I guess we're just going to roll with it. All good. I do need to turn this down, because holy cow. Please. Okay, well, we're going to do this through a different volume mixer then. Uh, you. Turn that down. Back over here. And then over here. This has been an interesting set of problems to have, but... Okay, so... For the last few days, fighting with networking, I think thing I've got that's resolved. Uh, we're we're currently like hardwired into the new router. If that's still going to be an issue, then I have yet another solution. But <sighs> so that being said, I don't think I can get this like alternate resolution thing done in less than a couple minutes. Uh, I've I've already been on stream for 13 minutes, and I still can't get the software to quite quite work with me. So we're just gonna. Shelf that one until I'm off the air. We'll come back to it. But let's go ahead and get this game started. I've, I'm looking forward to today's little bit of exploration. And hopefully, hopefully we can break free of our new shackles. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so. For those that missed the previous stream, we started um, a new campaign a while back. After having accidentally blown up the ship in hardcore mode, I think we're still in hardcore mode. I don't know for sure. And as a way of like soft, uh, soft saving, now I'm using an actual escape pod on the ship. So no matter what, I have to sacrifice like a certain amount of tonnage to make certain that my captain can at least get safely off the ship and not lose the whole story. Um. So we flew around for a while. We did some trade missions, got the attention of uh, a couple of different entities out there, and turns out the captain's psychic and can detect um, other systems around her at will without having to even like think about it. It's just a thing that happens now. Um, problem is, the second that it was found out that she was psychic, a bunch of stormtroopers showed up and... Uh, kidnapped her, did a surgery, installed a neural psychic inhibitor in the back of her neck, and are now making her uh, act as a go-between between two factions that are currently warring, and as a double agent, uh, specifically working for the dark side. And it really sucks. So the goal for tonight is we're going to try and break free of that control and hopefully save the people that right now we're about to unfortunately probably hurt um, just because of the whole neural thing being stuck in the back of our skull, literally forcing our character to do these things. This is one of those choose your own adventure stories where as part of one of the storyline options, you get your agency removed and... Uh, it becomes a very linear story, unfortunately, with all the grandeur before being seen kind of through a window as your character's like, well, I can see all that, but I can't do anything about it right now because I'm stuck here. It's interesting. So, let's get into it. Let's not set the laptop directly on its own power cord. Or accidentally unplug it. Okay, we're, we're having fun. Um, no. Oh yeah, and our, our ship is called the Puppy Cage, which is entertaining to me. Uh, I didn't expect it to be a cage. Like, I was just being playful. We bought this ship, titled it, uh, did a bunch of upgrades, and then got locked inside of it. Because of this whole neural inhibitor thing, they're like, uh, you're not allowed to be licensed or use any other vehicles or any other outfits. So I'm really glad that we got the upgrades that we did, because uh, that would have sucked otherwise. Now, that being said, what are we up to here? Drop by the Merrill Bar. Keep dropping into the bar on Merrill and Aldebaran system to see if the rebellion is 
Prepare to increase your security clearance. All right. So let's go back to Al Morale. Nobody here yet. Regular food wrap. Right? So we gotta go down to Vega. We had all these other missions lined up with Stigma Shipyards, United Shipping. Uh, I was working my way towards getting the attention of Rotharian and Gleetech, but. Unfortunately, we're we're locked into this storyline now, but it is what the community voted on, and I appreciate that you folks like put that vote out there. It um it makes it so that we get to touch on some of the storyline stuff that I w normally wouldn't go and seek out on my own. You go over to the now familiar Burton Marquis and get down to business. Like last time, he strikes a fair deal and speeds you on your way with ten tons of food for the rebellion. Okay. The Winston. Greetings. Greetings from the captain of the UFS Winston, a fine ship with a worthy name. O okay. Let's drop by on Earth and see if there's anything to be seen. Paul Pentecost. Of Atmos, the company that made this. Greetings. I babysit. It pays better. And don't tell me that was irrelevant. It was a hippopotamus. Uh, okay. Very well, Paul. Oh, that is such a cool ship, though. I love the pirate carriers. Nobody here. Nobody here to talk to. We got all these really fancy upgrades for the Starbridge. Wait, what? Oh, I see. Hmm. You get any attention to some dock workers and quickly get your cargo unloaded before heading off to check in with Jay and get your payment. You find Jay in his office hard at work on his computer. Come in, come in, he says. Brusquely, in response to your knocking. Back already? Oh, well, it's good to see you. We're looking a little short again, but your shipment should see us right. He fumbles around the inside of his desk before pulling out a slightly dirty credit ship. I believe this is what you're looking for. Keep checking the admission, BBS. It won't be long before, until we'll be needing your services again. I really, really hope that I can get that um, graphical update mod done on this because it will make it so I stop stumbling over my words quite so much. The font is... The carning on it feels not white, but pink, and like it's slightly moving, and there's nothing that I can really do about that. Uh, Rescue Rebel. Another Rebel agent has reported that he may have been compromised and needs extracting. Message from Jay. I've been informed another agent needs extracting. He's located on Rigel 3 in the Rigel system. Return him to Merrill. So we're going to go out to here. Say okay. Continue. I'm trying to think of what systems were orange before and aren't now. It Oh, I think it was Coria and Rebel 2. Wait, what? New New York? New New York was a flourishing colonial col council colony until the Gretic Plague destroyed all life here. The atmosphere is now a poisonous shell of its former self, containing mostly methane and variants thereof. Some remnants of the plague virus survive on the methane and sulfur compounds. You can feel the heat through your biosuit, and the sludge squishes under your feet as you walk in the deserted streets of the spaceport. There is nothing of worth here, and even if there was, it would never pass through your ship's biofilters.
Oh, that's interesting. That there's actually like filters built into the uh, the ship itself that protect it, and thereby like communities, other other spaceports and stuff. I always wondered like how they deal with basically any any containment of uh, viruses and stuff in universe. You land and go through your normal post-flight checklist as usual. When you're finished, you head outside to stretch your legs and sadly await the arrival of your passenger. Within five minutes, he arrives and you bring him on board to giving him the regulation five-minute tour. You then head back up to your cockpit to begin preparing to take him off to New England and the Wolf 359 system in accordance with Commander Crane's commands. As you head out into space, your mood is as somber as the sky. What happens if I... What happens if I don't? I'm gonna try and like disregard, and I, I hope this doesn't like kill the character or get anybody else hurt, but I'm I wanna see what happens. Okay, it let us warp. Matcha. Last time I was on Virar said the price of medical supplies is pretty low. Good to know. Oh, it won't let me. Nothing... What happened? That's so messed up. Like, even if I land there, they still don't do any... Also, that was a very, very populated system. I... Hmm. I hate this. Uh, okay. Your passenger exits straight into the arms of the waiting bureau investigators. He looks confused for a second before going red and turning to you, enraged. He lunges, only to be forcefully restrained by the pickup team. You're going to pay for this, the rebel yells with impotent fury as you watch on sadly, wishing you could, you could will yourself to help him. One of the men restraining the rebel clubs him over the head with a short baton and he slumps, unconscious. Good thinking, nods the leader, and the man is dragged away. She turns to you. We'll have a replacement for you to take back to the Rebels in a few hours. Meet us in the bar. <sighs> Somebody, anybody, notice. As you sit in the bar, enjoying a quiet drink, you sense the approach of a man with a distinctive mind of someone who's been recently trained as a bureau agent. When you look up, you're startled to see a man who appears to be the agent you just brought in casually walk into the bar. You quickly realize he's just a bureau agent surgically modified to look like the person you captured. He spots you and comes over. You're the sandwife, captain of the puppy cage. He asks, and you nod slowly. I believe you're supposed to take me to the Merrill and the Aldebaran system. I'm ready to go when you are. In despair, you stand up, leaving the rest of your drink unfinished, and the both of you head towards your ship. Alright. This is the beginning of their plan, like, actually taking shape. I've gotten the crust of the rebels and they've gone from just letting me bring food and equipment to bringing people in for extraction if they feel as though they've been compromised there's an entire battalion up there um so they just body doubled that guy that was requesting extraction and who knows what they've done to him This new person is a secret spy. A mole. Your passenger thanks you for helping him out as he leaves, but you cannot help but wish you'd never met the man. You wonder what he'll end up doing to these brave rebels in the name of the Bureau. You look over to see the muscular figure of Jay walking towards you. Good work, he states cheerfully. Come to my office. I have a credit chip with your name on it. When you get into his office, he goes over and starts rummaging through his desk drawers. Here it is, he says. At last, pulling out a credit chip. This should keep you eating for a few more days. I'll see you two at the general smarts of this universe to hear about this. He promises you more seriously as he hands you the chip. It never hurts to be in a, to get in a good little PR. 
As you leave his office, you can't help but feel despair at the damage you've already done. Once again, you wait for Jay to try to gain your attention before looking in his direction to see Jay waving his hand as he sits in his normal place with a young, slightly overweight woman next to him. You sit down and he grins at you. The guys in HQ want to move you up another link in the chain. It looks like you're on your way. He gives you a wink. Realistically, though, your next step isn't any different from your last one, but think of it as another, long, another rung pass to make it to the top. Are you in, or do you need a little more time to settle yourself in? With despair in your heart, you nod your acquiesce, your acceptance. Acquiescence could also work. We're talking now about insertion missions, Jay continues quietly, where you take an agent from here and plant them wherever they need to go to start their new lives as informants. Allow me to introduce Fiona. She needs to get into Denroman in the Journey's End system. The usual deal applies in keeping away from the Federation and the Bureau. Good luck to the both of you. You nod without thinking, knowing that this brave young lady is about to gain first-hand knowledge about the depravities of the Bureau. Despite your wishes on the contrary, you find yourself setting course to the New England in accordance with Commander Crane's wishes. Uh. <laughs> the music! Bum 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 bum! Ram bum bum bum! Bum 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 Whoa, who's hostile? Oh, it's a pirate. Okay. Getting into a fight. Oh. Ow. They damaged my shields. The Winston's here. Yuna looks a little confused when she sees the Bureau's strong arms as she steps out of your hatch. Comprehension comes slowly as she turns to you in despair. You turn away, shame beyond words. She stumbles into the arms of the waiting bureau team. Thanks, says one of them casually, as another smashes her over the head a few times with the short baton as they all seem to carry. Commander Crane left a message you are to make contact in the usual place, says the attractive team leader of her team as her team drags away from the unconscious rebel. We'll take care of the rest of the operation and replace her with one of our own. You take a few moments to collect yourself from the horror your life has become as the team leader slowly walks away. Hmm. Back to Earth. It seems like so long ago now. That we were just cruising around, being a space jockey on Earth. As soon as you land, you decide to head over to the bar to see if you can find Crane. No, we don't. You can sense Lirel waiting for you long before you dock with the Cane Band. As soon as you exit the ship, you watch him weave his mind power into physical existence and feel him poke you on the shoulder. After taking a moment to think about it, you clumsily mimic his actions and poke him back. Good. You are now a T4. You are a small step closer to feeling your way out of bondage. But right now we have something important to discuss. Lirain has been ordered to tell you the rules, so I am telling you to go and see him on Wolf 359. You move on the sidewalk bench where Lirel is sitting, and sit down next to him before responding that you received no such orders. Suddenly you feel an enormous pressure on your mind and freezes you into your seat. You may be powerful one day, but I have my orders, and you will obey them because you have no choice. Now go. As you walk away shaken, you realize that Lirel is only responding according to his orders, and that if he wanted to hurt you, there would have been precious little you could have done about it. He just wants you to do what, you, what must be done to preserve the status quo for the time being. You sense that he has hopes you might somehow help him and his people to overcome the bonds of slavery, but that, for that, but that for the moment, survival is the key. Still, feeling the awesome power, the full force of his mind is an experience you would not be willing to endure again. You vow to one day free yourself from the bonds that you hold, you and the Velos, enthrall to your Bureau Masters. Ah, uh, the Space Elves. They're so cool. Nobody at the shipyards. No other missions. Alright. So they told me to go to Earth to tell me to go back to Wolf 359. 
I'm not sure if that was supposed to happen. Or something glitched. A marauder. Ah. Alright. It was worth trying. Oh. So here's here's some Velo ships. These are the ones that once I become a powerful enough psychic, I can generate one of these as well. They're very neat little ships, but if I do, I lose my star bridge, which I do love my star bridge. It's a fun little ship. So I don't know. I guess we'll have to check it out. Hmm. We'll let you folks vote on it when it comes time. You find Clarent waiting for you along an officious looking bureau agent. Come, he wishes to talk more privately. You follow Flairain, and he leads you and the bureau agent into a private room. The Sandwife, begins the agent formally, these are the standing orders given to all telepaths under our control, and you will obey them all, without fail, understand. You nod, and the agent nods at Flairain. The first rule, Flairain verbalizes impassively, is that you must obey orders from only bureau personnel, and these orders must be weighed according to the rank of the person giving the order. It I.e., if you get two conflicting sets of orders, you will follow the orders of the person with the highest rank who is in the bureau. The second rule is that you must report any person or persona or persons who harbor ill intent towards the Bureau of Internal Investigation immediately to the nearest Bureau agent. The third rule is that you must resist all attempts to free you from your bondage with all your strength and to the best of your ability. And the last rule is that you must report all unenslaved telepaths to the nearest bureau agent as soon as possible. That is why you are enslaved, but you can thank Lirel that he said you should be captured, otherwise they would have destroyed you without thought. But you might be able to grow out of your bondage, unlike us fellows. We need to attain a higher power level than you to gain our freedom. With a nod of your head, you indicate that you have understood all the standing orders that you must follow, and to let Clarion know that you have accepted what he has told you. Good, states the bureau agent brusquely. Make sure you keep an eye out of both bars and Mission BBS around the place. Now return to your business. As he walks out the door, you and Flarian stare at each other for a long moment before Flarian drops his eyes in sorrow and walk and follows him out. There are no missions available here. Oh, no new mission. whole set of Auroran ships in here. As soon as you land, you can sense Lirel waiting for you, and you quickly go through your post-flight routine before disembarking from your ship and taking your way over to meet him. And it's time to show you how to travel. Follow me. You cannot help but feel a little excitement as he leads you to the space dock, and out onto a vacant pad where he immediately forms a protective barrier around himself, and you recognize the familiar shape of the Velo's dart. As you continue to observe, he shows you how to focus your mental energy into an elegant beam of pure physical power. After allowing the newly created ship to dissolve around him, he guides your mind to new ways of manipulating the universe around you. Within a few minutes, you learn the basics behind twisting missile guidance systems against themselves, and how to sense the physical size of ships around you as well as their intent towards you, and how to reach out of your mind to learn more about the general nature of nearby systems. Finally, he teaches you how to twist the space around you to create a hole through space, which you can enter hyperspace and travel the spaceways. I can just teleport at will now. Like, as a person, I don't even need a ship. I can just... That's so cool. Ah, oh, new user interface because we're a psychic. Now you will not need a pile of metal any longer, nor will you need any of these computer systems these humans need to see the space around them. You can fly as free as your mind can visualize. Go now to see Flairang. He will share with you our history and our dreams. Listen, for you may be the one who leads us out of slavery. You have it in you. With that, Lirel turns and walks away, and you are left trying to take in the enormous number of things he's shown you. Your mind almost feels tipsy with the overload. You walk away, unsure whether to feel ready to give your faithful vessel and whether you feel ready to give away your faithful vessel and begin living your life as a purely mental being. 
No. Oh, no. They completely changed my equipment because it's not the same ship anymore. You now have a Flower of Spring, a T3 strength level, an ability to distract sensors, a topographical sense, a physical size sensor, a telekinetic boost, a hostility sensor, a heavy weapons license, all my licenses. Okay. Your ranks and honors. T3 and United Shippy Carrier. I forgot about that. Wow, that feels so far away too now. Ship name, dart, ship class, Velos, dart, turn rate, 300 degrees per second. Max speed, 600. So, uh, that's, that's impressive, because our star bridge, uh, before all the upgrades, was 358. This might actually be a hardware upgrade over what we had. And this is absolutely a hardware upgrade over what most players would have when they end up running into the story. But I kind of, like, gave myself a top-of-the-line Starliner. <laughs> Also, the Flower of Spring, um, that's a special weapon that only the Telekinetics get, so that's kind of fun, too. Dart. When a Velocian is compelled his or her basic trainings in the Psy Arts, one of the first things they attempt to construct is the Delicate Dart. Like all Velocian ships, she is actually a pure psychic bearing that protects the Velos pilot within. It is perfectly formed for hyperspace travel, nearly matching the beautiful race, and will remain intact as long as enough of the mental energy of the Velos remains. That's so cool. Alright. No missions. We leave then. Oh yeah. Also, it's inertialess. One of the only ships in the game that is. But very zippy. Very zippy. How do I shoot? Ah. Oh. That's pretty cool. Back to Wolf 359 then. Let's go see Liral. Or Flaran. I don't remember which one. I had to relearn how to land. Ugh, that's so weird. As you pilot your way down through New England's atmosphere, you can sense Flirian waiting for you. When you land, he looks into your eyes for a long moment, and you can feel them observing your mind. It is time you learned our history. With that, he bombards you with images of the Velos race from its humble beginnings when all the telepaths left Earth nearly 3,000 years ago, when something known as the Spanish Inquisition threatened to destroy them all. They left under the Indian Prince Velos, and they traveled the galaxy for many centuries before finally settling on the planet Velos. You see them develop their abilities and watch their civilization grow. You see their biotechnology evolve until the day they begin growing nanite-producing organs to help protect them against disease and the effects of aging. To this day, other than the mental powers, this is the single biggest difference between the Velos and their human cousins. You find yourself trying to remember how to duplicate some of their skills, but the array thrown at you in so short a time dazzles you, and only a couple stick in your mind. You watch them greet the first human explorers, and you see the golden days of their involvement with the Colonial Council. You see the events leading to the Velos leaving the Council, and then opposing them and standing with the Polaris. Finally, you see the events of the Velos War, and the madness of the Colonial Council, and enslaving the entire Velos race. The final few moments are filled with observations of the universe during the awful days of isolation following the collapse of the Colonial Council and the rise of the Auroran Empire and the Federation. Finally, you see the creation of the Bureau and how its leaders quickly moved to take control of the Federation and are now looking to take control of the surrounding space as well. As suddenly as the mental visions began, they stop, leaving you blinking back in the real world. Now you know. Tears spark your eyes as you watch a somber Flirian walk away, and you know he is remembering the sights and sounds of the Velos civilization. As you step off your ship, you see a well-presented blonde waving you over towards her. Good to see you again, she says, and you realize you're talking to Commander Crane in person. 
Now that you've been made aware of the rules, I don't think there's any need for me to hide my identity from you any longer. She indicates you should sit on a park bench next to her and you comply. She pulls out a data pad and calls up a display of what appears to be a very detailed map of Aurora in space. We've been working out the details of a long-range plan, she explains. That involves the Aurorans. Our preparations are nearing completion, and we want to confirm that our intel on the political situation amongst our neighbors is correct. Of course, the other reason I want you to go is because I am going to be sending you on a number of missions amongst the Aurorans, and this is an easy way for you to familiarize yourself. You are going to be making a short jaunt into the Auroran Empire. Okay. She nods, continuing in a business-like tone. Obviously. I can't reveal to you the details of the coming operation for reasons of operational security, so you'll be going into this a little blind. However, I'm sure that with your telepathic abilities, you'll manage to get by. You nod and indicate that she should continue. I want you to head down to the Moash and the Moash system. She re informs you have to... <laughs> After referring to a report on her desk, land somewhere and have a quick look around. Find out what you can about their current status politically, economically, and militarily. When you're given the place to, when you, you're, when you've given the place the once over, head back here and report to me. Any questions? No. Good. I look forward to hearing your report soon. Yeah, I would not read the font there between you or your. That took a sec. My apologies. Okay. So into Moash space. Well, oh. wrong way. Huh. Yeah, learning how to fly this still. Whoa! Inhabited by the descendants of the first Polynesian spacefarers, Notus is a young world that is still somewhat volcanic. The rich soil and long growing season provide the people of Notus with a bounty of food and other produce throughout the year. As quakes are still common on this planet, tremor proof buildings have appeared in most places, echoing the designs of Peruvian Indians with their seemingly random interlocking blocks. It's not seemingly random then. Well, many young men and women have become members of the Federation Defense Forces and are renowned for being fierce warriors. Well, good for them. I can... Wait... I can... I can stick space marines on my psychic ship? Why is this an option? <laughs> This shouldn't let me. That's so messed up. Why is it letting me do this? Like, I'm going to do this. Welcome to piracy, folks. <laughs> the leader of these hard-looking men tells you that he's capable of increasing your chance of capturing any vessel enormously. And we don't need continuous cash flow, he explains in his deep voice. His men watch on with casual alertness. We have all the equipment we need, and we take small amounts of profit by foraging on every ship we board. They're pirates. You can hire pirates. Also, oh, 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 now that's interesting. There's certain equipment I can ask cash or grass. We got all the cash and grass we need. <laughs> um, there are still outfits that I'm not allowed to have, but that one, that's, it is letting me. I wonder what that increases my capture chances to. That's very fun. Okay. Moash. Who's hostile to me here? Oh, the station. That makes sense. Whew. 
Whoa! It's Jason Cook! Look at that ship. How do you prepare for death? Learn how to live. How do you learn how to live? Prepare for death. <laughs> this planet is a little different from the average Auroran planet you hear about in the Federation. Yes, it is polluted, and yes, there are an enormous number of poor people being oppressed by the warrior class. But the gaudiness, intricacy, and sheer amount of adornment on the arcologies of this world surprise you. You guess at the Moash House, who seem to be running this place, are fairly well off financially. You also notice there's an enormous number of the infamous Auroran warriors, wearing their colorfully savage tattoos, wandering about. Many of them give you menacing looks. In the few hours you spend wandering the arcology, you estimate you've seen several thousand warriors doing little or nothing. This Moash house must have a fair-sized military if it can afford to have so many warriors just sitting around. After several hours of exploring the arcology, you decide that it is time to start your journey back to New England to make your report to Crane. Can't buy those. Won't let me buy that one. It's interesting. This bar looks like it is many centuries old, and this is exactly what the bartender claims. He reckons the bar is the oldest pub in known space and has been in operation for over 1,200 years. Despite that, you know they obviously... Wait. Despite this, you know that they... That obviously they are yet to figure out how to brew a decent beer. Oh, that's rude. This is the homeworld of Moash House, but the Moash Ruling Council does not make its home here. Instead, because the Moash are also the first family, their leaders reside in the Aurora system. The population here has dis has declined since the induction of the Moash House as the first family. It is now only the second most populated world in, in known space, with some 200 billion inhabitants. This planet was where the local government representative of the Clo Colonial Council was located, in which what was then titled the Moash region of known space. This planet, like all the homeworlds of the five families and Aurora itself, has been settled for nearly a millennium. That's funny that I... Remember the Moash region bit. Oh, is there a more direct? No, there isn't. Okay. Oh, I don't have the horizontal booster anymore, so I can't, like, warp in the middle of things. Just out of curiosity. Okay. Onwards to Wolf 359 then. Who? Ah. Wow. Capture chance, 75%. And now they're my escort. And... Close channel. Interesting. There's... There's no income costs. I just have a pirate star bridge as my friend now. So that being said, I'm going to hail them and tell them to upgrade. Because they're only a class B. We can get them up to like a little warship like my, uh, my star bridge was. Surprisingly, you see the blonde haired Commander Crane waiting for you as, you as you exit your ship. Things went well, she asked by way of greeting you not, saying it would probably be best if you could talk to her in private. This had better be important. Follow me. She takes you to the familiar, empty-looking office. So, tell me what you saw. In response, you quickly run over what you saw from beginning to end, leaving nothing out. As you finish, she looks both impressed and satisfied. Good work! You are more observational than I, than I give you credit for. I'll have to make a couple minor adjustments to our initial picture, but we should be able to keep to our timetable. I have to pass on your intel to the proper people, but I don't want you wandering too far. Once I've gotten confirmation on a few things, I will need your services again. Keep an eye out in the bar. You see the Federation soldier, who is your normal contact to Crane, motion you over to the table. He points you to the rear door, telling you to go straight through. 
Mystified, you comply. After a long gray corridor, you go through a second door. You are greeted by the disgusting Lee. You are greeted by Commander Crane. Glad you came by. We need someone to go down to Moash Space and cause a bit of ruckus. You won't be out on your own, but seeing as now how you've gone down to the area, you are an ideal scout for such a mission. So you'll be leading a force of men into the area. It's fairly simple, really. All you have to do is head down into the station Courageous in the Moash Rep System and have a task force with you. While you're there, cause as much damage as possible. The ships going with you will be carrying a sizable force of ground troops who will cause as much havoc as possible once you are on board the station. When you, when the land commander, General Sutton, is, to, is satisfied he has completed his mission, return here and we'll take things from there. If things go as planned, I might need you to head back down there again almost immediately. As she walks away, you can sense the complexity of her overall plan belies the simplicity of what she's told you. Without a doubt, there is more going on here than initially meets the eye. <laughs> sure. I'm curious as to where where they want us to go. So, yeah, hold on. Out of curiosity. Most of these scenes I can't. Okay. Class C upgrade. What? What the hell? That's terrifying. Oh, I see. You know, I kind of want to take them to the wrong place. Have we never landed on Kismet? Passengers are left a little bug-eyed when you dissolve your protective shielding, leaving them standing on the dock. They pay for the fee of 15,000 credits and walk away talking animatedly amongst themselves. You smile, sensing that they're heading to the local bar to spread stories of their time on a Velos ship. One of many gas mining company, <laughs> One of many gas mining centers in the Federation, Kismet stands apart from its in its great harvest of chorite gas. A rare, heavy, noble gas. Chlorite gas is used as a coolant in modern Starship engines, where it is super cool to a liquid state. Chlorite is more stable than most other gases under radioactive bombardment and has the bonus of being totally non-toxic, although it's still dangerous in its super cooled liquid. Kismet makes a small fortune as the only known planet to have large raw supplies of this gas, and fate, Kismet, Hardy Limited, is one of the more heavily traded stocks in the Nikkei Index. Cute. This bar is filled with merchants and traders from all over the galaxy. They've come here looking to buy some of the chloride gas harvested here to sell it with enormous profit elsewhere in Federation space. So I finally have a reason to, like, do random missions to other places. Before we go to Moash Rep, though... Uh, I don't want to fly them through Rebel space. That That seems rude. Rude to the Rebels. They could go through Tykel, Port Cain to the back of Sheol. I mean, the game's not going to give me anything for that. That would just be me being a jerk to Sheol. <laughs> okay, let's let's do this. Whoa! Well! Turns out we were in, um, roguelike mode. And... Uh... 
Oh. Huh. I wonder why I didn't load that. Okay. Let's try that again. I forgot after getting into that, like, firefight that I was in fast forward mode. So that was a problem. We're gonna... Yeah, we're gonna land here on listening post 5. Refuel. This is... This is so messed up. Alright. Let's do this awful thing. Railgun explosions are so interesting in this. Everybody follow me. How old is... Uh, I don't know. Uh, take, take a look at that for me, actually. I'm curious. You, you have me curious. How old is this game? I want to say... Did I play this in junior high or high school? I want to say it was high school. Whoa, 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 that's a lot of those. Hold on. Greetings, no response detected. Those Federation carriers are concerningly powerful. I need to wait for my energy to recharge. This isn't exactly a warship Came out in 2002. So yeah, it would have been junior high. Capture ship. Hello, I have a new friend. Carriers destroy nearly everything. That's amazing. Okay, next one. Alright. Here we go. Without leaving your ship, you can sense the enormous amount of damage being done by the Federation soldiers all over the station. You estimate in a few hours the station will be virtually depopulated and practically uninhabitable. Despite the large number of men committed to this mission, you sense from the general set that this mission is far more for is more for show than anything else, and you guess this must be a diversion for a much larger main push elsewhere. Not that this mission is proceeding perfectly, you can sense the spirited resistance to the Moash warriors, and by the sound of the reports coming through your comm unit, these disorganized pockets of men are acquitting themselves admirably. Despite this, they are overwhelmed by the sheer numbers and the enormous amounts of firepower brought to bear upon them. A little over four hours after landing, you see the short blonde hair and tall broad figure of General Sutton coming aboard. 
That's it for us. We're finished here. Ugh, now most of Aurora hates me personally. Love that. Didn't want it to be this way. I really didn't. A known traitor to the Federation has stolen a ship was attempting to escape the Bureau by passing through this area of space. Nobody escapes from the Bureau. Also, here's my number. Velos number 412-3207-G. This is a covert mission, so the Federation Navy may well try to interfere with your efforts. Try to avoid outright confrontation, but do not waver from the primary objective. The ship in question has been seen in and around the system has been given the IFF code of traitor on your scanner. Find it, destroy it, and make your way to New England in the Wolf 359 system for debriefing. Traitor, not traitor. Let's go to Wolf 359. I'm a little confused. Well, whatever that was, it was big. Oh, it's the EMP nukes. Got it. Pyrogenesis star bridges. Don't see those often. Let's go to Nether Primus. I'm just trying to do systems that directly link to Soul. Because it said in or around. Tau setting. Ah, oh, Pegasus Trader. Found you. This ship is scary powerful. You play back the recording of the traitor's destruction of the mid-level bureau official who meets you in the docking bay. Good work, he says, handing you a data pad showing your newly cleaned Federation record on it. That should cover any damage done to your record. We will contact you again when we acquire your services. 
You wonder again how you got yourself mixed up in this business. It seems that just yesterday you were a simple trader, and now you're an indentured assassin? You see the Federation soldier, who's your normal contact to Crane, motioning over to his table. He points you toward the rear door, telling you to go straight through. Wait. What? We just did this. Oh, we got some marauders to fight. Ah. Uh. No! You... Jerk. I was trying to steal a pirate ship of my own. Alright, so I guess we get to go do that weird fight in Moash space again. But my record's all messed up. It's like it just didn't save that. Those fusion pulse explosions are gnarly. No! Uh, Alright. Open pilot. Oh, I hate the ringtone sound in this track. It sounds like my phone going off. Immediately turn left. Stay back for a second and let the rest of this fleet do their thing. Is that a Thunderhead? Nice. Oh. can't get through the railgun wall. Thankfully.
Things went well, asked Crane politely when you enter. You nod with a shrug. Will your little diversion work? The Moash warriors were drawn to the site of your raid, which allowed the Amass Federation fleet to launch an attack on the skeletal defensive which broke through their line almost immediately. You nodded a confirmation of your suspicions. By all accounts, most of the Moash fleet has either been defeated or captured, and we are in possession of their homeworld. More than that, we managed to grab the house elders before they managed to escape. Now that you're back, I'll be needing you for a dip diplomatic mission of sorts. Keep an eye out in the bar. I'll have everything ready for you soon. You sense the Federation soldier, who is your normal contact to Crane, waiting for you to arrive. He points you towards the rear door, telling you to go straight through. You nod and head down the long gray corridor towards Crane's new office. Things are moving along nicely, she informs you with her breathy voice when you walk in. The Federation forces are basically in complete control of Moash space. We're ready to begin the next phase of the operation. You see, we want to, con we want to subvert the entire Auroran Empire so that we can make use of its enormous resources. But we can never do it by force alone. We need help from within the Empire, so that we can at least have a little control over the events that we want to instigate. Now that we have control over Moash space, we've taken the Moash elders prisoner, we are now in position of power to bargain with the first family in order to get them on our side. It is time for you to start playing Diplomat. The Elders are under house arrest on Moash, in the Moash system. You are to go down there and tell them that we are prepared to make them an offer. And our offer is this. Firstly, we are prepared to let them return to their former preeminence. Sadly, secondly, we are prepared to help them eliminate the four other houses, leaving them in complete control of our in space. However, there is a catch. In return, we ask they become a vassal nation, not to the Federation, which they would never tolerate, but to the Bureau. Tell them we are willing to negotiate around the edges of these points, but if they aren't prepared to come to the tables, and we are prepared to destroy them utterly and to reveal their severely weakened state to all of their rivals, who will pick over them when we are finished. Any questions? No. Good. When you are finished, return here for further orders. Okay. Let me take a look here over at OBS. Yeah, we've been running for an hour and 50 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and take a short break here. We're going to be right back, and uh, we'll continue the story. This has been interesting. I hope you folks are enjoying. <laughs>
I do love chocolate with the orange peel in it. It's so good. Just saying. Hmm. I'm afraid that I've misplaced my drink. I think I finished it. But I'm afraid that I misplaced it. And I don't want to knock it over. Uh. What do you folks think of the story on this so far? I've been enjoying uh, getting to mess around a little bit with doing work on inflection, uh, trying to get different characterizations, and starting simpler with something that isn't quite as emotive and cartoony as something like Cave Story is more in line with the style of reading that my my voice lends itself to anyways. So it's been still a challenge nonetheless, but easier for me to work with. Roll myself a thing here. Actually, I will go ahead and put myself back up on the screen. What? Hello, hello. <laughs> um, find the correct screen. Dismiss that. Okay. Open this. Go over here. Okay. So yeah, uh, I I'm really glad that it like very quickly moved us from the you're being a complete dirtbag to the you're now a pawn as a weapon uh, weapon dog in the military. Um, for reasons unknown to me, like that's that's more tolerable uh, because at least like you're having to fight for your life instead of other people having to solely fight for theirs and you'd be in an absolute power. Um, for the first time, it's actually felt like there, there's been a legitimate threat against the character. And if I were to leave the, the save state alone, which I wasn't aware that the game was creating a save state, um, she'd be dead. We wouldn't be continuing this story. But I figure we're already here. May as well figure out how to get out of it. Um, I I would love to see a way to like get back at Commander Crane. Like, screw her. <laughs> she seems like a jerk. I mean, she is. She's she's the absolute worst. Um, I don't like the way that the author was trying to do this thing of like your character finds this other person physically attractive and is repulsed by it like i get it but you don't have to write it that way and i know that you're trying for something there but you don't have to write it that way <laughs> that was awkward to read and uh i'm just glad that i'm getting more used to filtering out and filtering through parts of the story that don't necessarily need to be read out loud Now, now I'm kind of wondering here. Let's take a look at OBS because is my audio capturing? Oh, it is. Okay, cool. What's up, Busta? Also, welcome home, Busta. What am I waiting for? It disconnected you. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Um, I was actually working on some of my emotes today. I want to go through and redo all of the ones that have the old hairstyle before I got the new one figured out. But that requires me settling down enough to like focus on art for a day. That's not always easy. Uh, that's one of the things that it's more so the pup handles uh, instead of Cassandra or Rue. So, yeah. Alright, I got this joint rolled. What was the, the... Oh, now I remember the mission. Saw it in Chatterino. Oh, you saw Talkie Dog Blue. 
Yeah, that one's funny. Um, they've approved Talkie Dog Blue and Red, and the original Talkie Dog. I removed the original because uh, I updated the graphic to have an additional three frames of movement so that it was more fluid. And you can see it in Talkie Dog Blue. Like, it looks really good. Um, they denied the updated version of original Talkie Dog because it contains cannabis. Now, can you tell me, looking at that emote, where it is right now, can you tell me where the cannabis is on that dog? <laughs> and so, like, even if we're green, could you tell me where the cannabis is on that dog? That being said, um, yeah, I've got, I got some other ones that I'll be getting fixed, but we're, we're not quite there yet. And I still want to finish some of the ones that I was getting new line art done. Um, I still need to do, uh, the femboy salute that I was going to do for puns and haven't really been able to chill to do that. So I don't know. We'll get there, but things are hectic right now. And with, like, struggling with trying to get licensing and getting internet functional in here, it's it's been a lot, but we're a little closer every day. Um, let's see. Looking at the storyline. Talk to the Moash elders. Right. Okay, so we are the political pawn. Going into oh who oh hi um we're the political pawn in this little fight and we're supposed to be on a diplomatic mission in House Aurora oh nope still House Moash. No, I clicked on studio mode. I didn't want that. Okay, there we go. How far can I jump on this ship? Also, it looks like I lost two of my... My hired... Well, hired help. Uh, <laughs> not so hired. Starbridge. Okay, they're as upgraded as they can be. Class D. Lap is the reason for the Moash family's affluence. It's perhaps the most fertile world in the Empire. <laughs> and produces enough food to feed more than any two houses. It is also one of the most stable food supplies. Its crops have never suffered a complete failure, and the last partial failure of any significant size was more than 70 years ago. The Moash house sells this enormous surplus to the, to the other four houses and make an enormous amount of money doing so. This planet is one of the most important resources the Moash House have, and it's protected by the fleets attached to the battle station in orbit. This room is filled with tired farmhands from the countless nearby farming... farming concerns. Unlike other members of the Auroran working class on other planets, these men seem to be well-fed and clothed, and they seem to have a little more self-esteem. Oh, we're on Moash Rep, that's why. We haven't gone far enough. Ooh, their planet's purple. As soon as you land, you are escorted by burial soldiers to meet the Moash House Elders. You do not have to use your telepathic abilities to see they are unhappy to be surrounded by heavily armed guards. You sit down at the head of the table and quickly outline the terms of Crane's proposal. When you finish, they stir, looking a little excited. You allow them to confer amongst themselves quietly for a few minutes until they turn back to you. How can we trust that you and your masters? asks the eldest-looking warrior of the group. 
You shake your head and say they can neither have faith or be destroyed. But you go on to say that the Bureau will only betray organizations that are no longer useful to them, and you explain that the Bureau has no wish to be tied down by the duties of direct rule. It prefers to operate behind the scenes. Finally, you explain in general, Bureau policy is deliberately destined to keep the status quo by keeping the masses happy and keeping its own involvement completely secret. The elders confer amongst themselves for some time before your patience begins to run out. You sense they're deliberately stalling to see if you'll give them any more information that they might use to their advantage. In disgust, you stand up and inform them that they have two hours to reach a decision, and you will await their response in the bar. You walk out with several bureau negotiators in tow, all trying to talk to you at once. And since none of them seem to be giving you direct orders, you decide to get away from them in the easiest way you know how. With a moment of concentration, you simply wrap yourself in your velos dart and pretend for a short while that the outside world does not exist. After no more than ten minutes of waiting in the somewhat stiff and unfriendly company of a few Federation soldiers based here, you sense one of the Moash house, house elders walking towards you in between two heavily armed and alert soldiers. They quickly spot you when they finally enter the spaceport and make their way over. We've talked it over, the old Moash warrior informs you, and the Moash house has accepted the Bureau's proposal. You nod and thank them for his time. You tell them that you will relay the information back to your superiors. He you tells them you will return to your you will return with further instructions. You nod to the soldiers around you and begin mentally preparing yourself for your journey back to New England to report to the terrible Commander Crane. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Bella. Family Bella. Family Haran. I don't remember the Vela. That was interesting that I managed to pick up some other part of the quest line that appears to have broken the order of this one. I hope that I don't run across that again, but uh, no way to say. <sighs> All right. Hell yeah. Got another boat. You're slightly surprised to sense of the deceitful weaving to Commander Crane's mind awaiting as you pilot your way down through New England's atmosphere. After dissolving your protective dart shaped shield, you were greeted by the sight of her blonde hair and figure. So, what did they say? She says quietly as she takes your arm and draws you out of earshot to the dock workers, busily moving around the area. You give her a quick summary of the events of your trip, and she looks pleased. Good work. Our plans are proceeding nicely. I have a few things I have to take care of, so I'll probably be out a little out of contact for a while, but it shouldn't be too long before I need your services again. Keep an eye out in bars anywhere in the Federation. When I need you again, I'll find you. Also, what's going on here? A manticore? Okay. Note to self, can't take on a manticore solo.
You can sense Commander Crane waiting for you just around the corner, and you cannot help but smile when you notice that nearly every male head in the bar keeps running surreptitiously in her direction. Chuckling to yourself at her naivety, you make your way over to her. How are things? You shrug your shoulders, nonplussed. Well, I'm glad I managed to catch up with you, as I have another mission that needs your skills. I need someone to take an encrypted message pod down to the Moash shelters containing instructions on what they should be doing in the coming months. She tells you in a lower voice as she leans forward. And right now, my resources are spread a little thin throughout the galaxy, so you're it. The message details how we want them to organize several military expeditions into Federation space. The first of this will be to supposedly gauge our strength, but following missions will supposedly be diversions to a main attack elsewhere. In reality, these raids will be made up of warriors not at the Moash house, and will be informed ahead of time of their arrival, and we will be able to move entire fleets to meet them. The end result will be four severely weakened houses, which will be advantageous to both the Moash house and ourselves. The only reason I'm telling you this is because the Moash elders might not open the message pod correctly, and if they don't, its contents will be vaporized. Once you deliver the message, she tells you, standing up, obviously preparing to leave. Return to New England, and I will make certain that further instructions are left for you there. This message pod is a, is a literal ton. It is a ton of information. Cannot be upgraded further. Alright. Got a blockade runner. That's fun. Don't tell me that I have to do, like, each of these fights. Because... I barely made it through that first one. Whoa! As soon as you land, you are greeted by a savagely tattooed Moash warrior who leaps at you in an effort to rip your throat out. You react by weaving the pattern of spring flowers Lyrell taught you, but you mistakenly force too much energy into your excitement. In an effort to keep the energy under control, you are forced to weave in a calming effect. You notice as you do that it almost resembles the warmth of the sun on your spring flower. You step over to the remains of the warrior and quickly head up to Moash Council Chambers and hand over the message pod to the old warrior at the head of the table and step back. He manages to fumble his way through opening without major, making any major mistakes and manages to scan the contents. After a few minutes, he looks up and thanks you for delivery. As you walk back to the space dock, you continually go over the fight in your mind, memorizing your actions. With a little practice, you think you should be able to duplicate that effect at any time. Mistakenly force too much energy in your excitement. In an effort to keep the energy under control, you're forced to weave it in a calming effect. Flower of Spring Hostility Sense Hmm Is it like another capture trader mission? And I bet if I tried it, it would break everything again. You're met by the soldier who's normally your contact at the bar who draws you aside. Commander Crane is currently detained doing other things at the moment. You sense he has no ideas to her current whereabouts. She wanted me to tell you that she'll be, she will need your talents again in the near future, 
when the plans you delivered to the MOAS start coming to fruition. So keep an eye out in bars. If we need your help again, that's where we'll make contact. The soldier claps his hand on your shoulder, nods, and walks away, quickly disappearing into the crowd. You notice after the fact, he seems to have the ability to blend into the crowd and be completely inconspicuous, even though he wears the very distinctive uniform of a Federation naval officer. You sense that he's simply doing something he was taught many years ago and has done many times since. Hmm. Okay. So it's not this bar. Yeah. No other missions. Capture Trader. Mod Starbridge Class D. Okay, let's go to Nezra Secundus, see if it's there. Nope. What about Nezra Primus? Yep, there it is. Oh! I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to capture them. Oops. Well. I guess we'll do we'll land again, see what we find. As soon as you walk in, you spot the blonde haired Commander Crane sitting at a table trying to fend off an unwanted male suitor. You make your way over quickly in the hope that you can discourage him enough so the crane will forget the incident and let him live. There you are! She exclaims, smiling, before turning back to the man. I'm sorry, but my business associate has arrived and we must speak in private. Could you please excuse us for a moment? The man takes one long look at you before nodding slightly, sullenly, and heading back to the bar to buy a drink. Your hopes sink when you sense Crane fling filing the instant away to be dealt with after you leave. He's lucky you turned up when you did. She informs you icily, and you laugh. She shakes off her bad mood. I have another message that needs to get to the Moash. That means you get to play Courier again. <clears throat> the message inside the pod contains details on the next stage of, oper of our operation. We want the Moash to step up the raids into our space and begin amassing an armada of their own. At a preordained time, detailed in the message you will be carrying, a Federation force will be attacked by the Moash and be destroyed. Public opinion will be inflamed, and war will be declared. An enormous Federation fleet will head down into Aurora in space in response and begin running amok, but only selectively so. The end result will be the destruction of the other four major houses. Then the remaining survivor, being Moash, will sue for peace, and we will grant it. Again, I'm only telling you this in case the Moash elders do not open the message pod correctly. Return to New England when you're done. You look over at the would-be suitor. Don't worry about him. He will be taken care of. Fuck. Also, sorry for swearing. Just, oh, that that guy's dead. Like, he he's not... Even if he isn't dead, like, he's he's gonna have his brain wiped or something. I don't know, but... Oh, that's, that's so bad. Oh, hey, Summer Bloom. Beautiful. 
beautiful. We have a new weapon. As you pilot your way to the destination, you find yourself exploring the nature of the device attached to the nape of your neck. After several days, you learn that it works by influencing the part of your brain that controls repetitive actions, or actions that become second nature. The end result is that you realize if you become skilled enough, you could simply bypass that portion of your brain, and you would be free to remove the device. You find yourself wondering how the device works on T1s like Leader L, who are more than skilled enough to do exactly this. Upon landing, you hand over the message pod to the same old warrior as last time, and watch him open it. After taking a few moments to scan the contents, he turns to you and thanks you again for your services. Before heading back to the launch pad, you quickly reform your protective shell and launch yourself into space. You find yourself becoming excited at the thought that one day, you might be free. There's just like a non-stop fight going on between these folks. Nope. Oh, that's scary powerful. Upon landing on New England, you were again met by the soldier who's normally your contact. He draws you in aside. A new situation has arisen, and Commander Crane is currently looking into it. She wants you to keep an eye out from bars around the place, as that is where she will make contact with you when she needs you. The soldier steps forward and gives you a warm hug before stepping away and smiling. He moves away, saying he will see you later tonight. Anyone watching outside would have thought the exchanges between old friends meeting for the first time in a long while. You smile at his disappearing back and shake your head in keeping with the charade, while letting your mind slip into thoughts of freedom. It's funny that most of these missions are just land back on Earth, go to the bar there. Crane just likes hanging out in this bar. Oh, maybe not. No missions. Interesting. I wonder if this is a matter of time has to pass? Let's try a different port. Let's go to Space Dock 4. We haven't been there in a minute. Oh. You sense Lirel observing you as you glide your way into dock, and you send out a small weave to acknowledge his presence. I see you've learned to create the summer bloom. It took the Velos nearly seven centuries to learn that. You've done well. Perhaps it is time you've learned how to better protect yourself against the hostile elements, intelligences of the universe. Come, watch. You follow his intelligence as it dances out into surrounding space and begins weaving a shell which you quickly recognize as the Velos Arrow. And within moments, you grasp the basics of it. When he sees you've understood the lesson, he returns to his body. You've definitely proved yourself to be a T2. I think it will not be long before you reach T1, as I have your strength and skill. As I have. Your strength and skill is growing. It would not be long before you rival even me.
You shake your head as you finally dissolve the protective barriers around you and make your way over to where Lirel is standing. But then you realize you have picked up everything he has taught you in a matter of moments, and the new weaves he have just shown you were not that difficult to follow, nor was the energy required for you to create. You may yet prove to be the one that leads us to our freedom. Do not worry. You are not far from your own freedom, but our freedom will require more effort on your part. He stands and nods in re his recognition of your prowess before moving off in the crowds, milling in the space dock. Commander Crane is waiting for you in the Kane Band bar as we speak. I suggest you meet with her. Wow, the difference in shields and, and hull. Much slower ship. Beautiful, though. Oh, yeah. That's a lot more combat functionality. Okay, cool. Okay. You walk straight past the soldier who's in normal contact and down the passageway at the rear of the bar before you can sense Crane waiting for you and you simply cannot be bothered dealing with the middleman. Getting a little cocky, are we, says Crane, icily when you enter. You will observe proper pr procedure every time you wish to see me. Understood. You nod without thinking. Good. Now, down to business. We have recently discovered that the Polaris have an intelligence organization that has managed to infiltrate into the Federation and possibly the Bureau for the last few years without our knowledge. We want you to find the headquarters before returning here. Ugh. All right. Well, we know about the Polaris isn't much, so you'll be going into this without forewarning. However, if anyone is capable of making their way to the Polaris defense grid, it would be one of you Velos. Besides which, the Polaris feel they owe you the, your people a debt for what you did when you sided with them against the Colonial Council centuries ago. You refrain from pointing out that you're just a telepath, not a Velos, because the information you were getting could well sa save your life, and mentioning it to her might endanger it. We have no idea where the Muhari have their headquarters located, she concludes dismissively. But once you've found it, you are to return here for a debrief. I was going to say, uh... Government Polaris... Trey... So we're looking for the Mukhari. I'm betting this is the system. Interesting. Well, let's go. It's funny that, like, I think I actually have the uh, warp capability to just go there without stopping now. Let's take a look. 600. Shields and armor, 50 and 8. Oh, wow, I didn't realize it was that bad. Shields and armor, 530. Wow. Speed, 425. Still faster than a star bridge, technically. Also, a lot more cargo space, hey? The Arrow is an undertaking that has been known to be completed by a very skilled T3, but is more usually in the purview of a T2. It is a mental barrier of enormous proportions that affords the Velos pilot excellent physical protection. The arrow differs visibly from the dart, and it is a significantly longer and more streamlined. That is certainly a more powerful vessel, but it is rarely seen in these dark times. It's very pretty. I can't buy any of these for this ship. Hmm. Nick V. Chini Poo. Marak. Chini Nika. Bisvayao. Kelari. We'll land on Kelari. Can you tell? I've been uh, playing this game for a really long time because I can pronounce all these names. 
Interesting. Hilari. This is an M-class planet with an enormous artificial ring which the Polaris found intact. The best theory on how it was constructed is that the materials were taken from the relatively small gas giant also in the system, which used to be much larger. The haze surrounding it, which is thought to be about 500,000 years old, will last another 1.5 million before collapsing, is the remains of that process. This is both the capital of the Polaris and the homeworld of Kalari, the leadership cast. Love to find mysterious intact rings. Yeah, you don't want those rings broken. Interestingly, the Kalari have all come from other castes and seem to be chosen by the members of their own caste. The only or the only criterion is that they seem that they be nearly a century be over a century old. The ruling council has four members from the Nicomoria, six from the Varash, eight from the Treperia, five from the Paid, and one from the Muhari. In addition, there is a leader who is given the title of Beast. This bar is filled with a number of brown-cloaked members of the leadership cast. You notice the presence of eight gray-cloaked warriors standing in the pairs in a rough diamond around one of the Kalari. Despite their air of relaxation, you note they seem to be aware of everything, and you feel their gaze bore into you whenever you make even the slightest of moves. There are no ships available for hire here. There are no missions available here. Hmm... So the Polaris are also space elves, also uh, at one point were humans, but um, became so far separated from the, well, super, um, super capitalist, I guess we'll say, uh, intentions of the Federation and initially the Colonial Council that they just said, nope, we're going to close our borders. Nobody gets to talk to us. They also happen to have, uh, through their society, managed to embrace the capabilities of different members of their society and make the most use out of them in that manner. So people that are really good at handling um, robotics end up getting into industry. People that are really good at understanding agriculture end up working as horticulturalists and scientists and so on. And it just... It's an interesting caste society. I don't necessarily like fully understand or even remember exactly how it works, but as far as, like, sci-fi, alternate universes, alternate political structures, this one's a fun one. Sandwich artists become sandwich artists. Damn right. So let's... Let's try going behind Kalari and see what we can find. White star. Hailing frequencies open. Greetings. That's a unique that I've never met before. I have no idea who that's supposed to be. See, that's an ordinary sprite. White star is a unique, though. Paro. The scientist cast maintains a research station here that primarily looks at the effects of various types of weaponry and space hazards on biological ship design. The Pyatt have created a significant number of Barash to observe and help them with their experiments, as they know more about biological ships than anyone else. Also, the Polaris have living ships. They're beautiful and sentient. As you walk in, you see a number of scientists in their dark blue clothing talking excitedly amongst themselves. Every now and again, the conversation stops momentarily. One of the Varash shakes her head and smilingly tells the Paiade why his theories will not work. 
I think that's uh, one of the casts of biotech versus one of the casts that are pure tech. But I can't remember. Gonna train me nor. Oh, we can't warp directly there. Hold on a sec. Homie Fuzz, like, in a void. I didn't realize that. Freya Cause, a trading post set up to support the enormous hydrogen sky mining operation on the gas giant below. It is here that the hydrogen is processed for transport to the various parts of Polaris space that require it. The Trapira on the station run a smooth operation that ensures all necessary hydrogen supplies are delivered ahead of time. This bar is filled with workers having a quiet drink after a long day working. The sea of white clothing is only broken by the occasional green jersey of one of the station's Varash engineers quietly enjoying a meal. I can't read that. I have to get closer. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, it's Trearvaria. This is an enormous gas giant which has in the atmosphere has the lar which has in its atmosphere has the largest hydrogen sky mining operation in the known galaxy. The Trapier has siphoned off the hydrogen and store it in magnetically sealed containers for transport to the station in orbit above Trearvaria. The hydrogen is put to a multitude of uses as a fuel and reacted to some of the processes by which the Varash create useful biological agents. This homey little bar has only a few white cloaked trapira who are obviously regulars. The bartender smiles at you and when he sees it, sees you and introduces you to all the people present. Soon you're trading stories and having a great time. Aww. <laughs> That's the first time the captain's like just had a good day. Oh, jeez. Because she's finally outside Federation space. Like, this is where she made a lot of money. This is where she met a lot of great people. Uh, it was downtime of as far as the stream. You folks didn't witness it. But there were no missions. It was just her going from point A to point B, back and forth and back and forth. But she had to talk to people on the ports Every time she lands, every time she docks, she has to go to all the authorities. She would have to go to the trading centers and actually unload all this stuff or assign somebody to do so when her ship got big enough. She spent time here, like a couple of years in universe. So this part of space is almost like a second home to her at this point. She's still an outsider, not even a member of any of the outcast casts, but is at least witnessed and honored as a star captain. So it's good to hear that she's actually, like, having a good time. <laughs> like, you don't read that often in the story. Actually, I want to... Local real estate agent promises cheap, good value land dealers a developer's dream, he proclaims, here in the player space. News from the front. A rebel task force has extracted a, has extracted an endangered cell of informants from the Ezra Primus system. Unfortunately, they had to destroy a number of Federation vessels as they were leaving. The way that's worded is really interesting to me. Ayolepla. Oop. What? Is that a neutron star? This trip here run station is used to absorb and funnel the unique radiations emanating from the neutron star named Trayon Olep. These radiations are then used to alert to alter the crystalline structure of prefabricated metal ship frames. The end result is a much stronger and more flexible material. Huh. One sec.
This bar is actually located in the outer areas of the station up against the outer walls. Part of the charm of this place is the occasional low, almost inaudible groans of the bioorganic outer shell of the station's slightly shifting position to better shield the occupants from the high levels of radiation outside. It's so weird, but yeah, the station's alive. It's a living creature. That's why they look so strange. Hmm... Kelfella. Kelarfell. Ooh, an arachnid. What land Kelarfell is mostly mountainous, but the vast majority of its surface is covered by water. Some 367 members of the Kelari, the leadership cast, make their homes here. From here they see the administration of all Polaris space from here to the border with the, war with the wraith in the farthest northern reaches of the Polaris exploration. This small bar has a couple member has a couple of members of the leadership cast having their lunch. They all nod in greeting as you walk past their seats, and the bar staff gets you everything that you want with a smile. Aww. Hmm. I'm kind of exploring now. I don't really know all of Polaris space all that well. What are you? I, uh... Oh, I can't read this because it's at the bottom of the screen. Even OBS couldn't tell me if I wanted... Well, maybe. Let's see. Ooh. No. Well, let's try. No, that doesn't display on my end. Okay. It was worth a try. <sighs> the Nikamoria. Gray Nailer. Hmm. Stop being an insulting little ferret. What an interesting way to say that. Uninhabited system. Ducky dog! Kalar, Treyar, Paar, Kaar, Verar. I don't know. I guess we're going to keep going around the edge of this? I hate to have to do this systematically this way. I feel like there's something I'm missing.
Investigation in order in orbit around Treyar Emma uses the methane gathered on the planet's surface to create organic compound. Okay, so. Mm hmm. Fluff. Treyar Emma has only been recently colonized, and there's only one small Trapira methane gathering operation present on the surface. The actual methane needs of the Polaris are only fairly small, but the Trapira recognize they may need some more soon as the Polaris population increases. So rather than reacting to a shortage, the worker cast began operations here. The spa is a place for the small number of closely knit Trapira who work here to unwind outside their work environment, where they are in constant pressure where they are under constant pressure to perform. Okay. I'm curious what happens if I fly out this direction. Whoa! I kind of forgot about the race. So I need to find a place that I can land. The Lair's government maintains an administrative outpost on this planet. The surrounding sector of space is basically government from here. The most amazing part is that some 380 Polarans seem to be all that is required to perform all the necessary administrative tasks that come with governing an entire sector of space. The fact that all the inhabitants here over a century old seems relatively innocuous by comparison, especially when the average life, is life expectancy for the Polaris is 205. Oops. You walk in to see a number of older-looking brown-cloaked Polarans eating a midday meal. You're somewhat startled to realize that the youngest person in the room is over 150 years old, and the oldest is some 270 years of age. They explain the life expectancy of a member of the Kalari is 247 years, and it's not un unusual for people to see for people to live and see their fourth century. It's really weird how like hyper-specific they are about those numbers. I don't think it's going to be, because, like, I don't know. I don't know. Most of the missions so far have been, like, really straightforward. Where it's like, yeah, go here. But this one's like, no, you gotta find it. <laughs> the Rosh in this room seem to be desperately trying to drink themselves into unconsciousness. From a somewhat glassy-eyed young man, you hear they have been working in a factory which separates the wanted biological agents from the biological sludge that covers the surface of the planet for the last three months. Tomorrow, they'll be returning for another three-month tour. There are process is a world... As a world is a bacteriological swamp that is in its early stages of evolution. Life on this planet has not yet reached the multicellular stage. The Varash, the healer slash engineer cast, make the bacterial sludge and convert it to biological agents that are useful in many ways. The products products created from the primordial soup on Varar Pisad are used as a growing for the biological components of Polaris technology, and in the healing of the sick and wounded. The Piate, the ancient scientist cast known, uh, the Piate, as the scientist cast is known, had the sky station built to show that it's possible to levitate a city-sized construction within a planet's atmosphere and to make it practically feasible without enormous wastage of power and energy. The planet below, called Pyre Vernial, Ver. Veraniso is left completely untouched. The Piat now uses a station called Piace as a home for many experiments into new theories for propulsion theory. Propulsion technology. Ugh. Yeah, that font that font though. That font hard to read.
a rocky planet. Prayer Tashesh is a small planet without an atmosphere to speak of. If it were not for the huge deposits of minerals and ores, it would remain completely undisturbed. Trapira work on this planet to mine and refine to meet these resources. The low gravity of the planet enables the Trapira to sling the refined ore into orbit with relative ease, where it is picked up by the Polaris freighters to be taken into various parts of Polaris space. This bar is cleverly hidden in the foliage in one of the enormous trees covering large portions of the surface of this planet. You cannot help admiring the ingenuity of the Trapira in building this absolutely ecologically friendly establishment. <laughs> Yaktia. An uninhabited station. Got it. Hilari, where we've already been, but I'm kind of tempted to land on again, just out of curiosity. Okay. That is a scarab? Big ship. Oh? Our bee of Rutak is a thin but quite breathable atmosphere. The Polaris named this planet after their first leader, Beast Rutak, who led the Polaris expedition for their entire 16 year sojourn. He died four days after they landed on Kalari, where they made their new home. He held the Polaris together against all odds, and even though he seemingly insurmountable difficulties, so in remembrance of his leadership, all the Polaris leaders are given the prefix Bis upon taking the mantle of command. That's cool. Shrey Sekila, Shrey Arvilam. The mostly water world is home to an indigenous kelp-like plant that grows many thousands of feet high and can be used to synthesize many different types of food. The Trapira introduces this type of plankton-like life form and nests in the reproductive buds on the kelp. As the plankton move on and reproduce, they spill the nearly microscopic seeds contained in the buds, therefore increasing the rate of reproduction of the kelp. The worker cast then harvest both the kelp and the plankton, which is also edible. If you did not know that every dish served in the bar for dinner is completely derived from the kelp and plankton harvested from the world's ocean, you would swear you had eaten foods imported from a vast variety of planets. You leave a little odd at the culinary capabilities of the people on this planet. Okay. Polaris, Polaris. <laughs> McDonald's finally mastered the kelp burger. I could see that. I do not know where I'm going. Shreyarini is a beautiful forest-covered world with extremely rich deposits of rare earths, and it's for these minerals that- oh, I am so tired of these. It's fluff. I get it, every world has information to read. I don't need it all. I don't need all of it. Is that not- okay, it's a station again. Uh -huh. Nilarakimoria. Nilkimoria. Kinda curious. Oh, we still landed on the wrong chunk here, anyways. Oh. Oh. Well, the only threat that was here just got vaporized. And this is the route that leads back down into Aurora in space, so don't think it's there. We're going to go to Bisuzoka and hope that along the way we find at least some hint of what we're looking for. Trepira, uh, Trero, Trevana, Helar, Heper. Huh. Oh, 
A world named for Biz Susoka, the leader who defied the old colonial council. This world is stunningly beautiful, and yet remains completely uninhabited as a symbol of the lonely existence she chose for the Polaris. Every time a new leader is chosen by the Polaris ruling council, that person must spend one month alone on this planet to remind them of the seriousness of their position. No other Polaris ever land on this world. This is a forested mountainous moon orbiting Arpis Usoka that has a small population of the Muhari, as the castless caste are called. The Muhari ensure the preservation of the pristine environment on Arpis Usoka and protect it from any outside incursion, warding it against all ships except those piloted by the new leaders of the Polaris. Arhuso is just a small green jewel of a moon. I think we might have found it. This tiny bar has a few black cloaked Muhari drinking in it when you arrive. As soon as they see you, they immediately all make sure that every need is taken care of before returning to their own drinks. You've never seen a group of people more concerned with your welfare. Okay, so it's not here either. But we appear to be getting closer to what we're looking for. Oh, what's here? Trearvano. Another gas station. Literally. Cambrians. I guess that should put into scale just how large the vehicle that I was using. Now, I had seven of these in my little platoon. Okay, that's a destroyed hypergate. What about this planet here? No? No Treyar? What about Treyaro? The Trepira built the station originally as a trade center for Treyar Pira. And while it still performs that function as Polaris society expanded, the worker caste expanded also. Now its primary function is to act as a logistical headquarters for the movement of many thousands of Trapira shipments throughout Polaris space. The leaders of the Trapira all reside here. Hmm. This is perhaps the most luxuriously appointed bar you have ever seen anywhere in the galaxy. Only a few white cloaked trapiras seem to drink here, but the drinks are the best you've had anywhere. What's up with this planet? Oh, it's another station. Got it. Well, what happens if I get close? Nope. Alright. Well, we'll get out of here. Pilar Heper. Pilar Heper is the administrative headquarters for all the surrounding Polaris-controlled space. While the planet is under the sway of the Kalari, as the leadership cast are known, the Drapira, the working cast, maintain a fairly large presence here to support both the Kalari and to cultivate extremely rich soil of this world. Kalar Heper is a mountainous, somewhat volcanic, yet extremely beautiful world. This bar has a large number of Trepira eating and drinking here, as well as a few of the brown cloak Kalari. You notice the Trepira have an attitude of defense of deference about them whenever eating with them. Aww. So, there's the planet, or the system, Muhari.
Nothing yet. A lot of arachnids. As soon as you land, you can feel the buzz of an intelligence network swirling around you. You can sense more than a few T4s and T5s trying to read your intent, but you easily blunt their attempts to observe you. You quickly cast your mind around. You can sense a large number of people working here consider themselves to be members of the Muhari. This confirms your suspicions. Without even dissolving your protective shell, you take off again, leaving the Polaris wondering as to your motives and landing. As you start your long journey back to Seoul, you catch flashes of awe coming from the Polaris on the planet, and you realize that Crane was correct. These people still feel indebted to the Velos for what you did for what they did for them. You cannot help but laugh quietly at the thought of an advanced civilization like the Polaris can still mistake you for a Velos. Wow. Nearly two centuries into the development of the caste system, it was decided there was a significant number of Polarans who did not easily fit into any one of the castes. Their talents had more of a general nature than a specific one, so the Castless caste was created, and this is their home world. The Castless all wear black to signify their shame at being incapable of entering another caste, and think of themselves as servants of all. Strangely, the other castes view these Muhari with a certain amount of awe, and even more strangely, the position of leader of the Polaris people has been held by more people who came from the Castless caste than any other. Muarharo has naturally occurring biological agents, rich rare earth veins, and dangerous and aggressive natural predators. Hence, jacks of all trades flourish here. This bar is filled with people wearing the black of the Muhari. As you walk in, they all give away. They all give away, and you find that your every need is met almost before you can voice it. It seems as if everyone is going out of their way to help you. Uh. Time to go. That is such a long route back. Oh, wow. I also just want to point out, I made it all the way back without stopping once for fuel. This ship is crazy. <laughs> you were met by a calm-looking commander crane when you land, but you can sense that despite her unruffled exterior, she is quite worried about the threat posed by these Muhari. Did you find it? She asks slightly impatiently as you make your way over. As you make her way over. You nod and inform her of the coordinates of the Muhari system and the Moharo planet. That's too far away. We're going to have to deal with them from this end. Damn. You're slightly taken aback by her display of emotion and say nothing. She thinks for a few moments. All right, there's no be use beating ourselves up about things we can't deal with. <laughs> Keep an eye out in the bar. We're going to have to do this the hard way. Am I not seeing something right here? No. That is it. I think time just isn't going quick enough. Let us go to Wolf. See what's there. Fun side note, this uh, this storyline, having given us our captain psychic powers, if we do end up getting another ship, we get to keep them. 
uh, we'll get to use those same psychic powers inside the electrics of our other ships. Georgia. Oh, Babylon. Hmm. No, nothing. Weird. Hmm. I'm confused. I don't know what I'm expected to do here. Capture traitor. Sure, let's go capture somebody. That should take up the time slot that we need. Oh, they're in Wolf 359? No, that's probably not it. They're probably in Corella. Bellows Dart. It's kind of Corella. Alfara, I guess? There we go. You can sense the deceitful mind of Commander Crane waiting for you, so as soon as you enter the bar, you make your way over to her. Remember the problem we've got with the Muhari? You nod as a familiar feeling of depression settles over you when you realize you're about to start destroying another group of people for the Bureau. Well, we need to know a little more about them before we can formulate any real plan of action. And we've no located the lady we believe to be a Muhari. Rain explains as she passes over a data file containing several pictures of a slim, young-looking brunette. She's currently living on Earth, and I want you to go and confirm whether or not she is a Muhari spy, and then take a report to the Bureau headquarters on New England to the Wolf 329 system. And don't dally. We need the information as fast as possible. Why are you here? And why won't you let me go? It takes you mere moments to locate the woman you're sent to find, because her mind shows obvious signs of having telepathic ability. After a few moments of careful weaving, you gently touch her mind and sense that she still has she has the ability to become a T4. She has yet to learn how to manipulate matter, and is so still a T5. She's a fairly skilled one, and a couple of times you're forced to cleverly weave around your probe to stop her from detecting it. You realize now how Lirel must have felt when he first saw you, you have no choice to report that this young brave woman has telepathic ability, despite the fact that you know that she will soon go through. The, despite the fact that you know what she will soon go through. As you put up your protective barrier, you find yourself hoping that the Bureau will, no, will decide to kill her rather than risk trying to enslave her. But as you point yourself in the direction of New England, Wolf 359, you know that the Bureau will never, will never allow such a tempting fish to slip through their fingers. I hate it. Velos delivering Glee Tech. That's silly.
As you pilot your way down through the atmosphere, you can sense the mind of a soldier who used normal contact to... <laughs> Let's try this again. As you pilot your way down through the atmosphere, you can sense the mind of a soldier who's your normal contact to Crane waiting for you at the edge of the space docks. Well, he asks calmly as you dissolve your protective barrier, but despite his easy manner, you can sense he's little more than worried by what you might say. You nod and confirm the Bureau's suspicions that the woman is in question is Muhari, adding that she is a skilled telepath. Did she know that she was getting probed? asks the soldier, his eyes widening slightly. You shake your head, but add that it was a near thing in the hope that he might decide it's a little too risky to try to capture the Muhari. This will complicate things a little. He grimaces, recovering quickly. He stands there for a few moments, and you can sense him trying to make a decision, and your hopes rise. You can sense him weighing his options carefully. After a few seconds, he straightens. I was going to bring you along with us to capture her, but if she's capable of giving you a hard time, if you're just trying to probe, I think it would be a little too risky. For now, I'm going to leave you to your own devices, but don't go too far, and keep an eye out for the mission BBS. So we will probably be requiring your services again before too long. As he walks away, you cannot help but feel a moment of triumph knowing that you've spared the life of one brave lady for at least a little while. Oh, is it specifically... Find the ship of the traitor. Oh, I forgot I was still doing that. Rusa and Sirusa. <laughs> Rusa has been mined nearly continuously for the last 900 years for its many and varied mineral deposits, but has now reached the end of its productive years. What remains behind is now only a shadow of the thriving mining communities that existed here mo even two decades ago. Groups of tourists travel here to view the still existing examples of early Colonial Council mining technology that remain perfectly preserved in the near vacuum of Trusa's atmosphere. This bar is the final tourist stop on a long tour of the planet's sites. These walls are devoted to pictures of Trusa's mining past, and the bartender even wears the uniform of miners worn when the Colonial Council was in existence. Cute. I'm a little confused as to where that, um... Oh, there it is. Never mind. Oh. Was I supposed to capture them? Well, they're dead now. It's not really what I was trying for, but hey. It would also help if I took it off X2 whenever, <laughs> whenever I'm in these fights. Oh no. The above person located on Space Dock 2 in Tykel is suspected to be a Muhari spy. Go to Space Dock 2 in Tykel's system to confirm whether or not the above person is a Muhari spy before going to Bureau HQ on New England. Okay. This person's in Rother. This extra sucks because we're like actively hunting people down. We're still enslaved. I would like to like you know continue that whole story um, getting out of that but we we're a little closer according to what the game has told us.
It only takes you moments to locate the person you are searching for because the Buhari's mind has been has been brought up in a social environment vastly different to what is experienced within the Federation, and to a telepath that stands out like a beacon. With a heavy heart, you weave into existence your protective barrier and head out into space to start your journey to New England. Oh, I hate that. That's so many of the Muhari ones. Normally, I would like to not do these kinds of absurdly long jump routes because you'd have to land in a bunch of ports and go refuel. But this ship seems to ignore physics. It takes you a lot longer to locate your suspect than you had anticipated, and you finally do find him, you realize why. He's merely a rebel informant, and has none of the obvious indications of having grown up in a totally foreign culture to mark his mind as being drastically different to those around him. Your momentary jubilation is quickly tempered by the knowledge this man will soon be going through the most terrifying ordeal of his life when the Bureau start trying to extract every last drop of information out of him. You head back to the spaceport with a heavy heart to start your journey to New England to make your report to the now familiar feelings of depression settle over you. Aww. You're greeted by the soldier, who is your normal contact, and you quickly confirm to him the Bureau's suspicions. You add it's easy to spot the Muhari because their minds are so different to anybody from the Federation, in the hope that he might still think it too risky to try capturing a Muhari at this time. Another piece of the puzzle. The more we know about them, the sooner we can come up with a workable plan. Keep looking in the BBS. It won't be long until we need you again. You were later met by the soldier, who is your normal contact, and you quickly tell him it was just a rebel informant. Oh, well. We can't expect every suspicious person to be a Muhari. Still, it never hurts to know the whereabouts of a few more of those silly rebels. Keep looking in the mission BBS. We're getting reports of suspicious activity all the time. Ugh. Who just got vaporized the second I got out of here, but they're dead now. Hmm. I'm going to truncate the uh, reading on some of these just because. This part of the story really sucks. And I'm trying to just push the story along a little bit. Rebel Informant.
actually Muhari. Oh, wrong one. This one. Same thing. You gotta be kidding me. Um, also, I just realized my music died. Hmm. We're gonna do a thing. This might nuke the bod. I'm sorry in advance. But I could use some other uh, music. Although I'm realizing house music isn't going to work for this, so let's go back real quick. We'll do some more No Thoughts at Empty, but different playlist. When we get there. Yeah, have a good one, hon. Um, thank you for joining me for the story. I'm probably going to actually take a short intermission to look into what needs to be done here as far as the plot goes without like giving myself too many spoilers um yeah i i hate this part of the story this is exactly the stuff that i was trying to avoid thank you so much i was doing <laughs> exactly yes i needed water i need to like kind of chill out for just a second read a little bit um so i'm i'm not just running in circles cuz Hasn't felt great. Uh, thank you both for the stretch. Oh. Uh. Yeah been an intense bit of reading like it sucks too because like i personally have a deep compassion and respect for the velos and the uh the polaris i love them so much that in most of my um like D, &D campaigns i usually include them as a faction just change to fantasy instead of space and, yeah, having to do this horrible spy game Cold War garbage that, it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor for the, uh, the way that American imperialism works. That's the whole point. And I appreciate that, like, Effectively, the the end plot points are something along the lines of uh, either take power or die. Um, something along those lines. Unfortunately, I never played it. I had one friend that made it through the storyline. It was like, this one's a little rough. Uh, personally, the ones that I like going for, that I, I really like the writing for, are the actual storyline for the Rebels is really fun. The people are great. Uh, the characters written for him are really good. As you may have noticed with some of the writing around them in the first place and why I'm so animated when reading their stuff. Uh, same thing goes for the actual Polaris missions, although they're very hard to get into because you basically have to go as an outcast um, into their space. And I think the only way that you normally 
naturally will do so without finding it on your own is by upsetting Federation forces and fleeing the entire sector. Uh, let's take a look here. Velos walk through. Drop by the bar. Okay, now we're on. Mission pod to the Moash elders. Confirm Muhari. Find Muhari HQ. Okay. Comp legal reward, pay value credits, random chance 50%, ship goal not applicable, time limit not applicable, government bureau. Mission computer repeating mission travel locations include Earth, Space Dock, Tykel, New Babylon, Desert Primus, Space Dock 3, Alfara, Port Kane, Las Vegas, Space Dock 4, Space Dock 5. The Bureau have located another person they suspect. Okay. Available from random Federation government spob. Travel to doesn't matter. Return to New England. The Bureau of located another person they suspect as a spy. Mission delay Ron. I see. So it's a 30% chance upon fish finishing one of the Muhari missions that uh, I just I, I haven't gotten lucky. 30% uh, chance on finishing one of these missions that you'll end up getting the uh, unregistered cutoff. Accepting this mission... Wait, hold on. This is a matter of just traveling to different places. Okay. So, yeah. Let's... Let us con continue these. And we're just gonna do... I... Don't want to do a bunch of them, because... That's messed up! Is it Bloodstone or Puerto Rio? Puerto Rio. Doing that grind. Just ruining people's lives, you know, casually.
Kinike and Colon. to like force it to flag out on something or at least get the uh, amount of time necessary. Yeah, what do we got? An Auroran carrier just attacking me for the hell of it? Yep, that's what it is. Six of those missions in a row. It's terrible. They're all written the exact same way. What does this say on here again? Travel to random 128's pub, return to wolf. Legal reward, time limit, pay value, credit, random look. one day sorry I'm like reading through on here what it might actually what it requires of me because it just 
30% chance to occur upon any mission computer record that says, Confirm Muhari. Offer text, the Bureau have located another person they suspect is a Muhari spy. And that's it. I think I found it. That is a different text offer than anything that it says in this, uh, this guide that I'm reading, so that's kind of wild. Info. The above person, located on New England in the Wolf 359 system, is suspected to be a Muhari spy. This is especially worrying as Bureau HQ is located on the same planet. Okay. okay. Delivery to New England. Okay. Do anything else that's going to New England? It only takes you moments to locate the person you are searching for because the Muhari's mind has been brought up in the social environment, blah 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 blah. With a heavy heart you head towards the HQ to make your report. You're greeted upon arrival by the soldier who is your normal contact and you quickly confirm to him. This is becoming intolerable, he comments. We need a new plan of attack that can ferret out these Muhari faster than we've been doing so far. Keep an eye out, chances are we'll be needing you again soon. A group of dock workers watch as you dissolve your protective steel shell, lowering your cargo of medical supplies to the ground where they begin to move it to storage warehouse. That's cool. Oh no, did I lose my pirate vessel? I did. Aww. I liked that ship. I guess let's go to Tau City. We never go there. There we go. As soon as you glide down to land, you cannot help but smile when you sense Flitterman waiting for you in the spaceport. I see you've grown since we last met. You look like life as a slave is wearing you down. Perhaps I can offer you some temporary cheer. Have you yet learned about the javelin or the autumn petal? You shake your head, smiling in eagerness. He laughs and pokes you on the shoulder with his telekinetic finger. We'll watch closely, and I will show you how. You sit down, preparing to follow Flareon's mind, when you suddenly, your mind is filled with images of him weaving a javelin into existence around himself. After a few moments of surprise, you adjust to the different method of teaching, and begin following Flareon's steps weave by weave until you've created a javelin of your own. Oh. As soon as he recognizes that you've picked up the lesson, he begins to bombard in your mind with the images of him weaving a flower of spring, quickly turning it into a summer bloom, and then weaving what appears to be falling petals around it to contain the enormous energies he's pouring into it. You spend several seconds recre recreating his weaves, whilst getting commentary from Lorraine until you're both satisfied. This is so loud. One sec. I also don't want this to, like, get me flagged. Uh, where was I? 
Okay, you spend several seconds recreating his weaves while getting commentary from Florain until you're both satisfied. He ends the connection as quickly as he started, and you come away grinning, but a little puzzled as to why he taught you differently than Lirel. Lirel is a T1. Even though I'm a strong T2, his abilities far outstrip mine. Not to mention that as a T1, he can unify the en energy of several telepaths at once into one wave of energy to use at his disposal. Anyway, speaking of Lirel, he's been talking to Crane, and she wants you to meet her on New England. I hope I've cheered you up at least a little. You're going to need it if you have to deal with her. It's true. Ah, ship upgrade. Double the armor. A little bit extra on shields. My apologies. Hundred and thirty tons of free space. This is a big ship. Hmm. Oh wow. Oh yeah. Okay, so we have the flower of spring, the summer bloom, and now the autumn petal. And it does not straight fire. But, in addition to that, I can now do this. And summon darts of my own through sheer willpower. I am now a problem. You can sense the bloody mind of Commander Crane waiting for you as you slide through the atmosphere. As soon as you dissolve your protective barrier, she comes over. We're going to start about looking for the Muhari a little more cleverly. Now, you say that you can detect them easily? You nod, realizing the Bureau may have found a way to exploit your attempts to save the Muhari. Excellent! Here's what I want you to do. Simply put, look around. Keep your telepathic senses open. I want you to find these damn Muhari, and when, I, when you do, I want you to report back here, understand? You nod, your heart sinking in your chest. Good. Now get to work. <sighs> no mission specifics. There's nothing that I can click here that just says, yeah, go here. So, uh, we're at three hours, nine minutes. We're pretty close to ending here. I'm probably going to scoot around in space a little bit more and see if I can push the last bit of story that I can through for today. Because I think we're actually getting close to the end of it, thankfully. Uh, if we're up to being nearly a T0 by the ranking of what the, the game told us to expect for the different telepaths. Oh, a lightning. I forgot that's actually the name of a type of ship. As soon as you land, you can sense the foreign thought patterns of a Muhari from across the globe. You take the trouble to go and get pictures of the Muhari in the local bar, so the Bureau will be able to identify the man should they need to. After getting the photos processed, you head back out into space with a heavy heart to report to Commander Crane. Ugh. Whoa! To your surprise, you can sense Commander Crane already waiting for you as you gently slide down through the atmosphere. I take it you have another Muhari to report. Whereabouts? You tell her the exact location and hand over the photos. Okay. She nods. <laughs> she nods, barely looking at the photos, and you can tell without touching your mind that things are about to start rolling. We've come up with a plan to deal with these Muhari, and we'll be needing your skills. Meet me in the bar in one hour. You spend the hour sitting in a quiet corner of the bar, keeping tabs on the location of Commander Crane. She flits from one corner of the bureau HQ to, HQ to another. But as soon as the hour approaches, she makes her way to the bar, and you can sense her in a new focus. The Mulhari threat is too large to deal with solely from the scent. We believe we've located most of their network, but it would be too difficult for us to shut it down without them shutting down and going to ground. 
and given the skills we've seen deployed by these Muhari so far, we would be hard-pressed to pull in more than half of the ones we're aware of. So we need something else to, for them to focus on. We need the Polaris to bring in as many of their resources as possible so that we can concentrate our efforts and nab as much of their network as possible in one single operation. Now, you may or may not know, the Aurora operation went forward without a hitch some months ago. We've now a unified ally that shares a border with the Polaris. So I'm ordering you to liaise with an Aurora task force that is currently forming the sender system. Once you've sent the task force to commander on the Kunjo s station, you are to proceed to the Polaris capital Kalari in the Kalari system. Okay. Doing as much damage along the way as possible. You are to act primarily as a guide, but do not flinch from helping the Aurorans do their work. However, the Auroran ships are largely irrelevant. If they do not survive to re return to Auroran space, I won't be shedding any tears, as it is going to be vexing enough for you to have to barter with the Moash to gain control over the Polaris. Any questions? She asks, and you shake your head, despairing at the damage you're about to inflict. No? Good. <laughs> Okay. Time to go do another war crime. Don't like this. Go team. You sense the off-field reactions of the awaiting roars as they watch you slide down to the land landing pad. As soon as you dissolve your protective shell, an older warrior with hundreds of small tattoos covering the exposed areas of flesh makes his way over and introduces himself as Task Force Commander Arkak. Arkak. You're here to guide us into battle against the mysterious Polaris, no? He asks in a soft, almost sibilant voice, and you nod, sensing he is the most physically capable man you've ever met. We'll need a couple of hours to make our final arrangements. Meet me in the bar in three hours. We will be ready. With that, he turns on his heel, and you watch him give a few quiet orders, whereupon the many men scurry into action. You can sense the almost arrogantly self-confident mind of Akrak. Ugh. Moving around, receiving reports and giving orders as you sit in the fairly deserted bar. The more you study the man, the more you come to admire him. You can sense his awesome sense of honor, which he uses to guide his every decision. And you are more than a little impressed by his, his incredible physical capabilities. You can even sense his dislike at the fellow Moash warriors, whom he despises as dishonorable and soft. When he walks into the bar slightly more than three hours later, he apologizes for being tardy, but you wave it away as being irrelevant. He bows in response. We are ready to go, he tells you with a short bow. All we need is your guidance. You nod, and with a sinking heart, remember Crane's orders to make sure none of the Auroran ships are to survive the operation. You guess that the Shady Moash sent the troublesome but effective Arkrak with exactly that in mind. This sucks. That guy's cool. Where... <laughs> Everything's hostile to us. We haven't even gone there yet, and everything's already hostile to us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my Polaris friends. Run. Or I am terror on the wing. And you are nothing but ash. Oh. I forgot those Wraith Bullets are pretty powerful. Also, holy cow, the Polaris are very just... overwhelmingly good in combat. A 
As soon as you land, you are staggered by several thousand minds attacking you at once as all the telepaths amongst the Polaris attack you in a desperate attempt to protect their home planet. None of their attacks is anywhere near enough to destroy you, but the sheer volume nearly overwhelms you. In desperation, you begin to twist their attacks away in groups out into space, but that is not enough. It seems like an eternity, but after a titanic battle of about 15 seconds, they break through all your barriers and stab into your mind. In a moment of sheer panic, you try to expel all the energy coming into your mind in a single powerful burst, which you control by weaving by adding weaves of storm clouds around the summer bloom weaves. You realize in the back of your mind you've managed to create the devastating winter tempest attack. Suddenly you understand that if you use the energy the player's telepaths are pumping into you, you are in absolutely no danger of being overwhelmed. You begin dancing amongst the Polaris, using their own energy to build barriers around their telepathic senses to stop them from attacking. Within moments the Polaris see the futility of their efforts and the, the attacks cease. In a flash of inspiration, you realize you can now see how your brain functions as a separate from your mind. With trembling fingers, you reach back and remove the enslavement device, watching with interest the flares of activity in the parts of your brain that it controls, but keeping them from affecting you. In moments, you are finally free. How did you survive the destruction of your nanites? asked one of the nearby Polaris after several awestruck moments. With that comment, you realize just how these evil devices retain control over even the most powerful Velos telepaths. The devices destroy the nanites that are a biological necessity for every Velos. Then, in a moment of surprise, you can sense that Arkrak managed to reach an escape pod and is being transported to the surface. You reach out and manipulate his mind, telling him to meet you in the bar. No way. Also, my shield's doubled. You're forced to reach out and talk directly to the minds of the players who want to hold our crack that you wish to see him in the bar. Within moments, he's standing before you. What is it that you want? He says in a silky, quiet voice, and you can sense the anger he feels towards you. In response, you hear you enter his mind and show him an accelerated paced series of images detailing how you were enslaved and your life sense the moment you were able to free yourself. When you release him, he looks stunned for several moments before rising and turning to look at you. Apology accepted, he says, bowing, and you smile, happy as he understood. I guess I'll be spending some time with these mysterious Polaris, but one day I will return to the Empire. As of today, I outright renounce the Moash House and vow to bring about its downfall. With a nod to you, he turns and indicates to his grey-cloaked escorts that he is ready to go. As you watch Akrak being led away, you realize that his last statement would have shocked most Aurorans. Despite all your telepathic abilities, only now do you sense how powerful his sense of honor is. With a sigh, you close your eyes and launch your mind out into space, trying to locate your friend Lirel. It takes you several minutes, but eventually you're able to sense, sense his mind honors the very edge of your perception. With all your might, you reach out and manipulate his mind, letting him know that you will be coming to see him. After a moment of surprise, he quickly re rearranges his surface thoughts to let you know he is understood, and he will meet you in the bar. When you open your eyes again, you see standing before you a brown-cloaked woman with whom you sense is a leader of the Polaris people. What will you do now? she asks. I will go to learn how to free my friends, I reply. You know what? I think we'll call that good for the night. That... <laughs> that was a rough story. And... There's hope. And light at the end, and I want to um, kind of save that as a as a thing to look forward to. We've done the work today, and it was hard. <laughs> it was hard. Ah, uh, I'm I'm sorry. I I care a lot about the different peoples in this universe, their history, their culture things that were lost. <laughs>
and um, the actual sense of getting to be uh, be able to help. But you had to grow to be literally the most powerful telepath in the universe first. <laughs> it is saved now. I will quit. That's... Um, wow. Wow. Uh, so, that was a lot. That was, that was a lot, a lot. Um, thank you everybody for coming, coming to join and, and listen to story time tonight. <laughs> Hopefully, tomorrow's a bit more, um, upbeat and fun the 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 actual like action adventure part of it versus that slog oh. all right let's see who we want to raid tonight who's doing what i want to say that i saw koi yeah koi is streaming let me jump over here real quick see if anybody else needs our help any more than they do Nah, they do. Okay. So let's send you over there. Say hi, everybody. We'll do a green glow dog raid. Get this up here. Okay. You folks have a lovely night. I will be back tomorrow evening around 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll see you then.